Hi, uh, so my name is Katie Klamala. Uh, so I work at Citizen Lab, um, which is a research group based out of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Uh, so I was here speaking last year, as well as at Sector, about targeted malware towards human rights groups. Um, and so that was part of our targeted threats project. And so just as a follow-up, um, when I was here, I was saying we're going to have this big report that's going to be out soon. Um, and it took a while, but it is actually finally out. Um, and so it actually follows uh, 10 different human rights groups uh, over four years. Um, and it's divided into two sections. There's an executive summary, which has a really high level overview. Um, as well, there's an extended analysis, and that has a lot of work on clustering malware campaigns and identifying threat actor groups. Um, so you can find all of that at targetedthreats.net. And I forgot, there's also some Yara signatures and technical indicators that are up there as well. Uh, so I'm actually going to be talking more about mobile issues today. Um, so when we were doing our targeted threats report, a lot of that was based around uh, Windows malware. Um, but so what's been happening more is we're hearing more and more about uh, mobile concerns. And so I'm just going to give a little bit of a background on that uh, before I talk about censorship, because that tends to be the most uh, opaque form of surveillance. Um, and so how sort of informational denial uh, leads to an increase in malware and how that relates to other terms of surveillance. And then I'm just going to do a bit of a case study. Uh, so when we were working with the groups in our study, um, a lot of them, uh, especially the Tibetan groups, they've been dealing with targeted malware for a long, long time. And so they've gotten really good at being able to identify it and having security awareness campaigns um, to really kind of reduce uh, the attack vector, uh, which in this case is document malware. Um, uh, and so they've gotten very good at this, like I said. Um, but so more and more they're worried about mobile communications and applications, and now they have to develop all these new um, awareness campaigns to deal with this. So the first app that you always hear about with China-facing groups is called WeChat. Um, and so this is a chat application uh, that's made by Tencent, which is a Chinese company. And so it hooks into their QQ uh, social network. Um, and so it has a huge user base. Um, it's kind of equivalent to Facebook in that everyone is using it. Uh, but since it's a Chinese company, uh, so they're subject to Chinese laws. Um, and so because of that, there's a lot of anecdotal reports of people being picked up and arrested for what they say on WeChat, um, as well as their censorship of mainland Chinese users. And so this is a quote from one of our study participants. Um, and so they're just trying to get at that there's this huge desire um, to be connected to everyone else. And platforms like WeChat really allow this, but there's also huge risk. Um, and so in their case, they have to kind of start over with their campaigns. Um, and for WeChat, there's really nothing they can do but say, don't use this. Uh, but so WeChat is not the only application that has uh, censorship on it. Um, pretty much every single uh, Chinese company will do this. Um, so the most simple thing is they'll just block keywords. Um, and so you may not be able to post a message that is about, say, politically sensitive events, um, or say a group like Falun Gong. Um, so another app that we started noticing is called Line. Um, so this is a little different because it's made by a Japanese co company. Um, and so for them to expand into China, um, what they started doing was implementing keyword censorship as well. Uh, thankfully, they do this on the client side, so we can actually just see all the words um, that they are censoring and get kind of a good um, view into the po uh, political climate that way. Um, but so, yeah, so they don't allow Chinese, uh, Chinese customers to send messages to anyone else. Uh, that use these block keywords. It just says, hey, you can't send that message. And then also users who are outside of China but are messaging someone who is in China, um, they think their message went through, but it's actually censored on the Chinese user's side. And so uh, Line actually responded to this. And they pretty much said, hey, we have to do this uh, if we want to operate in a lucrative market. And there's nothing that you know we're going to do about it, but don't talk to us about it anymore. 
And so that's the risk that all these companies face. Um, if they're not willing to comply with Chinese law, uh, they just can't operate. Uh, their application is going to be blocked. Um, and so one major implication of this is uh, there's no access to the Google Play Store. In some areas, it's just completely blocked. Um, in others, it's just really slow and unreliable. Um, and of course, a uh, kind of escalation of this that can happen is if there's a period of unrest, the whole internet can just get shut down. And we've seen this happen a few times. So since uh, in some regions there's no access to the Google Play Store, um, what we found out was happening was a well-respected uh, Tibetan security trainer. He was trying to get people not to use WeChat because, again, uh, there's just nothing you can do but say don't use WeChat. And so in this case, he was promoting an alternative that's called KakaoTalk. Um, so it's made by a South Korean company, um, and so they thought that was more safe. Uh, but they were actually sending around the APK for it uh, by email, uh, just that way they could reach people. Um, and so what happened is one of the recipients uh, for, these email, for this email, um, his account happened to be compromised. And so uh, whoever the attacker was, they took this legitimate, uh, legitimate app, um, they implanted malware into it, and then they just repurposed that email from the trainer and started sending it around. So all these people, <laughs> it looked like this trainer was sending them malware. And so like I said, that was just put into the app. Uh, it had a bunch of additional permissions uh, that it needed. That way it could log things like your text messages, your contacts, your location, um, call records. And then it just uploaded it all. So it's really easy to think, hey, like this would never happen to me. And when you go and you see a lot of reports of this uh, kind of thing happening in the news, people are just like, hey, well, don't download apps from third parties. Um, but again, this isn't possible uh, for people in certain regions. Um, and realistically, they do need to try to promote um, something that is an alternative to WeChat. Um, but yeah, since they have uh, you no know, sort of trusted infrastructure and there's a highly fragmented app market um, for Android, there's just like this is a risk um, that's going to happen. Um, and so, of course, uh, this has been focusing on Android malware um, simply because when we are working with study, uh, our, the participants in our study, uh, they only received Android malware. And um, mostly just because Android malware is far more widespread. Um, so we haven't really seen uh, iPhone malware that much. Um, also, since iPhones are expensive and we tend to be working with the global south, uh, just not as many people have them. Um, and on top of that, there's kind of an extra layer of technical sophistication um, to do iPhone malware, because either you're going to have to have someone who has a jailbroken phone, or you're going to have to worry about jailbreaking it yourself. Um, and so if that's like a tether jailbreak, you're going to have to compromise their computer first. Um, and so there's kind of, it's a little bit more of a pain. Um, but I think it is important to note that kind of the downside of Apple having this centralized uh, application market is it's also really easy for them to just deny access uh, to things like circumvention tools uh, at the request of the local government. Um, and so of course what you see happening is all these companies uh, turning these tools into a product. Um, and so they do have them for the traditional platforms, Windows, OS X, um, but they've also started getting into the mobile sphere. So two of the big offenders for this are Gamma International. Uh, so they make something called FinFisher. Um, and then there's also Hacking Team, um, and they make Remote Control System, or RCS. Um, so FinFisher, they have it for iPhone, Android, Symbian, and even Windows Mobile. Um, well, Hacking Team has iPhone, Android, and there's probably more that we just haven't seen yet. And so what they do like to do is say, hey, you know, we only sell to trusted governments. And so some of the time they do. Um, Finn Fisher, uh, well, Gamma International, they recently had about like 40 gigs of uh, documents leaked. Um, and so this is uh, a support request um, 
that was in the leaked documents, and this was actually from uh, Australia's New South Wales police. And so in this case, uh, the police were actually pretty concerned that we need to respect what is legal privilege. Um, but at the same time, uh, Finn Fisher is also being used in countries that don't have the greatest human rights records, and just one example of that is Bahrain. So just this past summer, um, we saw hacking, hacking teams uh, Android implant for the first time. So in this case, what they were doing um, was they were implanting it into a news application. Um, and this news source is based in an uh, area of Saudi Arabia that has history of religious tensions and um, protests and unrest. Uh, but so this was actually, the app was just seeded uh, via Twitter. Um, so it wasn't as super highly targeted as uh, the, uh, the Kakao Talk example, uh, but there is a political subtext to this. Um, and so companies like Hacking Team, uh, this was really uh, a nice bundled product. Um, they're able to configure um, their agent so it uses only the features that they want. And then they, in this case, they used an exploit uh, to root the phone. Uh, that way they could do all sorts of more fun things, uh, just like reading from the frame buffer, um, so you could take screenshots when the application wasn't active, um, is just one example. But um, so there, again, they're able to bundle this, and then they're able to wrap it up with something like DexGuard, um, so it makes it really annoying for us to actually look at. And so then, of course, uh, they also have this nice interface for whoever is doing, uh, doing the monitoring. Um, this is another, again, this is a screenshot from leaked documents uh, from Hacking Team. Um, and so they create, again, like this really nice user interface where you can see what everyone is doing. Um, you can go, hey, like this application is active. Here's all these network connections. Going to grab some screenshots. Um, and that way, uh, you can just be monitoring all the time. Um, so they also put some gritty, pretty great uh, promotional materials together. Um, <laughs> this is a screenshot from one of their videos. They're very good at playing off our fears of terrorism. Um, but uh, yeah, so they're able to just kind of market this all over. Um, so just recently, uh, the EU has um, listed uh, surveillance tools like this on what they call their dual uh, use list, um, which is important for exporting uh, because then they would require a license. Um, so this hasn't been adopted um, by all the EU countries yet. This is very recent. Um, but this is kind of an action that would hopefully uh, prevent them from exporting to um, regimes that aren't so great. Um, if this will actually work, who knows? Uh, so also, so all these companies like Hacking Team and Gamma, they also make uh, network injection appliances uh, just to make it a little easier to uh, serve up their product. Um, and of course, you always have to worry about government requests for data. Um, so even that Kakao Talk app I was talking about that the Tibetans are using uh, because it's more safe. Um, the, Kore the South Korean government recently had them hand over all sorts of user data and conversation logs. Um, because the president is doing a cyber investigation uh, over some rumors that have been going around uh, about her. Um, and of course, like we always talk about the global south, but obviously uh, surveillance is something that we all, uh, we have to worry about everywhere. Um, and obviously sometimes it's hard to say exactly how much is happening. So I just wanted to talk about Hong Kong right now. Um, as most people know, there have been a lot of protests recently uh, because Beijing recently went back on a promise to allow free elections and has said they need to approve uh, every single candidate. And so this has kind of brought a lot of mobile issues into focus. Um, so of course, there's been the aggressive censorship. Uh, keywords like even just Hong Kong and umbrella um, which is a symbol <laughs> of the protesters, these have been blocked. Um, so then there is also, uh, there's a group called Code for HK, 
Um, and they were kind of like a hacker group going and uh, doing things like, say, recommending uh, safer apps for people to use, like suggesting people use Telegram. Unfortunately, what wound up happening um, is this phishing message started going around saying, hey, Code for HK made this really great app and it will help you organize protests. Um, <laughs> but it was actually malware. <laughs> um, and so they had this for both iPhone and Android. Uh, the iPhone case, uh, you had to have a jailbroken phone. Um, but it was really kind of just taking advantage of uh, this group's reputation. Um, and so then the Android version just uh, hit the same C2, um, and they both just had kind of the features that you would expect going through call logs and text messages, contacts, that sort of thing. Uh, so finally, uh, we started seeing a lot of media reports about an app called FireChat. And they were kind of sensationalists saying, hey, this app is, you know, uh, breaking through the great uh, firewall of China was a good one, um, or fueling the protests. And so FireChat is an app that just recently came out this spring. Um, and so it was in intended for more if you're at a concert and you want to talk to your friends, um, but there's no, uh, say, cell phone reception. Because they had a net, uh, mesh networking mode uh, where you could talk to your friends via Bluetooth. Um, they also, of course, had uh, regular chats um, that everyone could join, and they also had theme rooms, which would go around a keyword, and Ebola is a very popular one. Um, but, yeah, so this app was intended for that. And so because of that, um, just by design, it had no encryption um, anywhere, uh, both network traffic as well as encrypting your chat logs on disk. Um, and there was also no user authentication. So I could just make my username anyone's. Um, you could intercept messages, um, pretty much everything. But despite this, um, it was adopted in Hong Kong and Iraq um, just because of, the mesh, again, the mesh networking feature. Uh, so Iraq is where we first saw it start to get common. Um, because there was uh, the rumors of internet shutdown. Um, and so before that, like this is their uh, download, uh, right? So before that, they really hadn't been adopted by that many people. And then they kind of got a huge amount of downloads. Um, and they believe most of these users were in Iraq. Um, just an aside that someone, sorry, someone at Bloomberg is like really proud of that headline, but. <laughs> um, so the creators of the app, um, they were kind of happy about this. Um, this is one just tweeting that, hey, like we're a tool of the revolution and all of this. Um, but in media reports, they were willing to admit, hey, this isn't very secure. Um, this is probably not the best app that you should be using. Unfortunately, though, on the download page, um, they didn't really say anything at that. So there was no clear message to the users um, about whether this is something that they could use for private uh, communications or if the app was just offering uh, 4chan-style uh, anonymity. Um, they have recently put a uh, warning on now. now. Um, and so also because of all these criticisms, uh, they've really tried to retrofit the app um, with security features, um, trying to encrypt some of the network traffic, um, as well as having usernames with authentication. Um, and these have actually all made the app really clunky and harder to use, but um, they still haven't fixed uh, certain other problems. Um, your chat logs still just are safe to, di uh, safe to disk in plain text. Um, and so while they made it so it wipes the cached uh, chats on, on sign out, um, there's actually a bug in it where sometimes you'll continue to receive messages um, even after you've signed out of fire chat. So you may not even know that there's these messages on your phone. And if you haven't signed out, like anyone can just read them. Um, so perhaps unsurprisingly, this, 
Okay, so perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, this wasn't really the greatest app for people to be using. Um, despite that, I think it is important that it offered uh, the protesters something they wanted. Um, this was an app that you didn't need internet for, um, and that was also free of kind of centralized surveillance and uh, censorship. The only problem was it was also trivial for the police to just go and see everything that everyone was saying um, and plant false information, uh, pretend to be other people, um, anything like that. So uh, the developers, obviously, they didn't have any sort of threat modeling or they didn't really think about this. Um, but maybe that's a new kind of future area to look into, um, looking at more secure mesh networking. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, um, I think the key points are there really needs to be an awareness of what, uh, what, uh, what a service is offering. Um, because people don't really know uh, if it is protecting your privacy and how. Um, even here, like there's a lot of misconceptions about what Tor is offering. Uh, is offering. Um, so we also need to consider the regional context. Um, it's really easy for us to pass judgments um, and give all these security recommendations where um, they might not actually apply to certain parts of the world, um, especially among uh, groups like the Tibetans who are just highly, highly targeted um, over and over again. Um, so then none of these are really super new problems, um, but it is new that everyone has uh, one of these devices in their pocket. And it's uh, also more difficult for the groups to start to get people to think and realize that um, their mobile device is pretty much just a small computer. Uh, so you can find out more of our research at citizenlab.org. Um, I have also included at the end of the slide deck a list of reports that I think are pretty good. Um, and so I just also wanted to give uh, a few quick thank yous to uh, Ted Campbell, who let me put malware on his phone and also proved that you're not only always your own worst critic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Andre Petrov uh, for not letting time zones get in the way of me practicing. Um, and then Laura Satula for always being able to see, uh, say things nicely. Um, and then also, of course, to the B-Sides organizers for putting up with me.